Telescope viewers, welcome to This Week in Turkey. This evening, our guest will be Professor Murat Somar joining us to speak about the retired admiral's open letter to the government, expressing their concern over Ankara's intention to build Canal Istanbul and its implications for the Montreux Treaty. But first, let's begin our bulletin with the latest numbers relating to the pandemic. Record high case numbers continue to increase across Turkey. According to the data released by the Ministry of Health, the daily number of new cases on April 8th has been announced as 55,941 and the number of deaths as 258. These numbers have led to the total number of cases to reach 3,689,866 and the death toll to become 33,201. An open letter signed by 104 retired admirals was released late on April 3rd. In the letter, the admirals said it was worrying to open the Montreux Convention, the international treaty regulating the status of the Turkish Straits, up to debate as part of talks on Canal Istanbul. The letter expressed concern over Ankara's intention to build Canal Istanbul, an artificial canal project that aims to connect the Black Sea north of Istanbul to the Marmara Sea to the south. The controversial project has triggered a debate on the revision of the 1936 Montreux Convention. The Montreux Convention guarantees the free passage through the Bosphorus and the Dardanelle Straits of civilian vessels in times of both peace and war. It also regulates the use of the straits by military vessels from non-Black Sea countries. Once completed, Canal Istanbul, dubbed as one of President Erdogan's crazy projects, will provide a shorter way for naval vessels from non-Black Sea countries to reach the Black Sea, so long as they pay the necessary fees. Erdogan believes that the canal will ease shipping traffic on the Bosphorus Strait, one of the world's busiest maritime passages, and prevent accidents. President Erdogan stated that they will hold a tender for Canal Istanbul and lay the groundwork for it in the summer. President Erdogan has previously stated that the Montreux Convention will not be binding for Canal Istanbul. If a need arises in the future, we won't hesitate to review any convention to make our country have a better one," Erdogan had said. In this context, the Admiral's letter praised the Montreux Convention, urging the government to refrain from opening it to debate. We are of the opinion that all kinds of statements and actions that can make the Montreux Convention, which holds a significant place in Turkey's survival, a subject of debate or put it onto the table should be avoided, the letter said. The retired admirals further stated, the army should stick to the Turkish Republic's founding principles and the contemporary route drawn by its founder, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. The declaration also mentions leaked photos showing Rear Admiral Mehmet Sarı in Islamic clothes in a home together with the members of who are said to be the members of a pro-government religious group. The letter was condemned by the presidential office. Due to Turkey's history of repeated military coups, the admirals have been accused of implicitly threatening the government with a coup. Since then, a judicial investigation has been launched and 10 admirals have been detained. Those detained include Cem Gürdeniz, the name behind Turkey's controversial Blue Homeland Doctrine, which claims vast sections of the Mediterranean and Aegean and its undersea energy deposits. The concept is at odds with Greece and Cyprus's claims in the region. Prosecutors also ordered four other suspects to report to Ankara police within three days, opting not to detain them because of their age. The former senior military leaders are accused of using force and violence to get rid of the constitutional order. Erdogan addressed a letter on April 5th, stating that the letter could not be labeled as freedom of speech and had malevolent coup implications. He added his administration had no plans to pull out of the Montreux Convention. The letter has led to mixed reactions within the opposition parties. While some opposition politicians say that the government is using the declaration to distract the public from the country's real problems, others have taken side with the admirals. Several senior figures of the main opposition, Republican People's Party, announced support for the retired officers, saying that they offered patriotic criticism and exercised their freedom of expression. However, CHP Chair Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu and spokesperson Faik Öztrak called the debate a fake agenda meant to distract the public from the real problems. Good Party Chair Meral Akşener slammed the letter by the admirals, calling it nonsense talk. Akşener said that the statement served the government, 
allowing them to divert public attention from the problems of the country. She added, the fact that the declaration was released at midnight resembled coup memorandums, and this gave the government the opportunity to stamp on it. Our guest this evening is Professor Murat Somash. Professor Somash is a faculty member at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Koch University. Hello, Professor Somar. Thank you so much for having joined us today. Hello, Merhaba. Happy to be here. So the letter, the open letter by the 104 retired admirals uh, released uh, earlier last uh, week, this week, uh, has prompted government members and pro-government media to depict the letter as a veiled threat of a coup, while others have assessed it in terms of freedom of speech. How do you uh, evaluate this letter, Professor? Do you sense there's a coup insinuation from the statement, given um, you know, the history of military coups in Turkey? No, not necessarily. Uh, legally speaking, uh, I think I can safely say definitely uh, no. Uh, there is no invitation to violence or to a coup uh, in this uh, statement, uh, in this letter. There is no hate uh, speech. Um, we can see uh, this yet another example in recent times by the uh, AKP government uh, to weaponize the law, the law and uh, to use the law differently for the supporters and uh, critiques uh, of the government. Uh, for the supporters of the government, the law is often used as, a, as an immunity, as a prote protection or shield. And if, uh, against the uh, critiques of the government, it is used uh, as, a, as a weapon to, to punish uh, the, the critiques. So we can see it uh, this way. Um, to uh, establish any, uh, any claim uh, of, of a coup threat, the, the prosecutors would uh, uh, find any material evidence uh, between uh, this letter and any uh, plotted coup. And they would be very hard pressed uh, to find uh, this kind of evidence because the admirals are retired. They don't have any material connection. They don't have the authority actually to really uh, to do this. Uh, politically speaking, um, one could criticize the tone, uh, timing, and medium uh, of this uh, letter um, in light of Turkey's history of uh, military coups or and attempted coups. Um, having said that, we should also remember actually that during AKP governments, uh, Turkey also also has a, a history of civilian coups uh, against the uh, government. Uh, we uh, may remember that you know, during the 2000s, uh, the AKP government and its ally, uh, the Gulenist ally, um, had accused the military of uh, plotting a coup uh, based on fabricated evidence. And all of these uh, officers were uh, later acquitted. Uh, but uh, this was used to purge uh, secularist officers uh, from the military and to weaken uh, the military uh, uh, politically. And recently, after uh, this um, uh, letter um, uh, was announced, uh, there have been some uh, claims by the military officers that you know there there is some kind of a, a, a full play uh, in this. Uh, um, announcement of this uh, letter because they claim that you know they, they approved the letter but they did not uh, approve the timing uh, um, uh, of this letter uh, being announced uh, late at night uh, resembling some kind of a, a coup uh, a threat and also the medium uh, that it was uh, first I think published in a uh, extreme um, um, extreme nationalist uh, website with not the, the seller uh, reputation. Uh, so they, they say that, you know, they did not know. Uh, so this was not really agreed upon. So uh, these are all, of course, uh, right now uh, claims. Um, but uh, so we should remember that, you know, politically speaking, we could uh, interpret actually what is happening here. And uh, also in light of the fact that immediately after this announcement uh, of this letter, the government began to use uh, the letter uh, to uh, really accuse the, uh, them of uh, plotting a coup. And also uh, not only them personally, but also the whole opposition, it's, uh, not the whole opposition, uh, but in a way dividing the opposition, the main opposition party, they immediately began to claim that you know, they have something to do with the letter, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, one other uh, political aspect uh, of this uh, message, of this letter, uh, is that uh, it seems to indicate at least a partial uh, breakup of yet another uh, partnership uh, of uh, partnership by, by Erdogan, because many of these uh, uh, 
I think we can call um, uh, secular patriotic uh, officers uh, had been quite supportive uh, of the government since 2016. And people were talking about uh, some kind of an alliance between Erdogan and uh, the, uh, this patriotic uh, camp. Um, and uh, now, of course, they, uh, uh, they uh, turned critical uh, of Erdogan. But this is the... This is partial uh, because uh, other uh, uh, patriotic uh, uh, political actors uh, who used to be, who, who seem to be part of this alliance with uh, Erdogan, uh, they uh, continue to be supportive uh, of him. But as far as uh, these admirals, uh, these uh, retired officers are con uh, concerned, uh, they uh, seem to uh, uh, part, with, uh, part with Erdogan. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, Professor, I mean, these are retired admirals, they're not uh, in, on active duty, and as often is the case, um, and as you said, the, the law is weaponized by the ruling uh, Justice and uh, Development Party, and in this case, that's also a similar situation because ten, 10 of the admirals have been detained, and their detention period at this point has been extended, um, while four others are uh, under, um, I mean, also under judicial control. So could the probe into the open letter lead to similar purges in the armed forces, like after the fallout with the Gulenists following the 2016 coup attempt? What kind of political gains can the government hope to gain from this crisis? Yeah, um, I think that you're indicating some uh, things that are quite important, uh, actually, because, you know, immediately these even if the, these admirals did anything uh, wrong and, you know, the, the government uh, is critical of it, uh, they could be invited uh, for uh, interrogation and, you know, they, they didn't need to be uh, detained. Um, the, the reaction seems to be very harsh and very organized and almost uh, prepared. Um, of course, you know, this is just interpretation, speculation at this point. It could be that, you know, they, they just got organized very really quickly, but there is a very harsh reaction. And um, uh, so the government uh, seems to create the appearance that, you know, uh, there is something really very serious uh, and the government is the victim and the, the admirals are guilty uh, before even being, you know, before being tried, before uh, being shown to be guilty of anything, uh, that this appearance of uh, guilt and attack against the government. So there is, the, there is this uh, very clear attempt by the uh, government. And that, uh, of course, uh, uh, raises the question uh, whether uh, the uh, government is trying to um, gain uh, politically uh, from this event, uh, even if did not, yeah. So if uh, there is definitely some kind of an expectation of political benefit uh, from this. Um, so, um, would there be other purges within the uh, government? So far, there is no indication uh, of it. Uh, this may be a warning against any critical voices within the military, uh, within the rest of the bureaucracy, uh, or within the uh, patri patriotic circles uh, who had been um, uh, supportive of the government for instrumental reasons, uh, because the ideologically they are quite different from Erdogan, the AKP. But for instrumental reasons, the Kurdish issue and some um, uh, elements of the uh, government's foreign policy, they had been supportive uh, and against the uh, Gudenist, uh, the threat uh, that, the, that they were um, the, acting together uh, with the uh, government. Um, but it is, um, it seems that actually that uh, we see this uh, quite frequently uh, that the government is, uh, uh, aside from this warning sign against critics, it's trying to keep alive a threat perception uh, within its uh, base. Um, and this, uh, you know, uh, of course, is to uh, keep the base uh, to, together. Um, uh, this has been the main strategy uh, of the government uh, to maintain its support. Uh, basically, uh, fear uh, that, you know, uh, there, is a, there is a constant threat uh, against Turkey, against the government, against the supporters of the government. Uh, so there is a, this very conscious, deliberate attempt to, uh, to, to do this. Um, Yet another uh, political gain may be to, to, to drive a wedge uh, within the opposition um, because uh, this was difficult uh, for the opposition. Uh, this was situation quite difficult for the opposition to uh, react, uh, react to. Um, there were different types of reactions. Um, so um, so the, the, uh, dividing the opposition uh, might be yet another expected uh, uh, expected okay. gain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just one last thing I could also mention that uh, the uh, to 
maintain this perception of fear, uh, the government always portrays itself as a victim, all right, is victim of uh, something, foreign uh, elements or the military or secularists uh, or other uh, forces. Um, but in this case, it, it is really uh, not uh, one of those cases that are really not so credible. Um, so by trying to uh, portray itself as a victim uh, based on the very uh, weakly credible uh, case, uh, also casts a sh uh, shadow of doubt on uh, uh, past uh, situations where uh, the uh, government uh, more credibly uh, port portrayed itself uh, as victim. Uh, we can remember the 2008 uh, court case to ban the party, uh, for example, or the 2007 uh, crisis. Um, and others uh, where the government uh, seemed to be more legitimate uh, in uh, casting itself uh, as a victim. But uh, the fact that it is doing it right now, uh, even in these uh, current situations, um, really makes also past claims about victimhood uh, less credible. Professor, you mentioned that one of the political gains that AKP hopes to perhaps win from this crisis is uh, to drive a wedge between uh, the opposition. And indeed, the letter has led to a variety of divided responses in the opposition. And the one which has been uh, spoken about quite extensively is the response of Good Party Chair Meral Akshenar, where she labeled the letter as nonsense talk for, uh, for lack of a better translation. So how do you evaluate her reaction and the potential damage that it might cause her image, her alliances, and especially with her voter base? I think uh, I think it did some damage uh, to uh, her uh, improving, ascending uh, political uh, image, uh, because I think uh, he she needed to uh, strike a balance uh, between distan distancing herself uh, from any uh, coup plot or also from the politics of the admirals, uh, because politically uh, the what the admirals did can be criticized. Uh, because even if you are criticizing uh, the right things, uh, you, in politics, you need to do this in a way uh, that can uh, bring about uh, results. Um, so you have to do it in alliances, you have to do it, uh, you have to time it uh, correctly, you have to uh, uh, find the right discourse uh, that will be uh, uh, that will uh, find uh, that will uh, appeal uh, to a majority of the people in society. So in, in, in this case, politically, uh, what the admirals did could be uh, criticized. Um, so she, she wanted to distance herself from the politics of the admirals. However, um, at the same time, she should also uh, have uh, defended them um, in the face of the government's ongoing authoritarianism. So the government has been uh, very uh, uh, oppressive, uh, of any critiques uh, and by, as we said, you know, by weaponizing the law against any uh, people criticizing the government. So she needed to, at the same time, uh, show uh, side with the admirals as victims of this authoritarianism, which she didn't. Uh, on the other hand, one uh, last issue that the, the adjective uh, that she used, I think this uh, <laughs> attracted a lot of attention. Um, this is nonsense talk, but it is actually, it's hard to translate, but it's actually more than that because it's more a uh, pejorative term. Uh, she almost actually uh, called them, uh, you know, foolish. Um, and uh, even if you can criticize the politics of the admirals, these are uh, respected, uh, very experienced uh, military officers uh, that uh, served uh, in the highest positions of the uh, military bureaucracy of the country. Uh, and at the end, you know, their uh, motivations are also quite uh, um, patriotic. Uh, but also maybe most importantly, which uh, I haven't mentioned, uh, emphasized enough, uh, aside from the tone of the letter, uh, what they criticize uh, in the letter, uh, the actioner should have uh, shown uh, some sympathy for, uh, because um, as far as the content of the letter is concerned, uh, the admirals are criticizing two things. One, uh, the, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, somebody took a picture uh, of an uh, admiral in the, uh, uh, in the Navy, uh, apparently, uh, during, uh, during a, um, a tariqat uh, cer uh, cer uh, ceremony. Uh, so basically, a um, religious uh, brotherhood uh, ceremony. So now, of course, citizens have uh, have the right uh, 
to, to, to be members of uh, religious uh, groups uh, or to be religious, that's one thing. But on the other hand, if you're in a very high level uh, military officer, of course, any membership, uh, membership of these officers uh, should be very uh, carefully scrutinized, whether it is a radical leftist group or whether it is radical religious group. Of course, this is something that uh, cannot be accepted. So they were very criticized that the, the military is really uh, removing uh, these controls uh, uh, against, uh, for example, uh, uh, religious radicalism that they, uh, rec uh, rec they may recruit um, um, re religious radicals uh, to the military. This is a very legitimate uh, criticism. Action now should have also uh, supported. The second criticism that they have is that the um, uh, President Erdogan seems to have uh, started a discussion uh, in connection with the Canal Istanbul mega project this Montreux Treaty uh, uh, on the uh, uh, Bosphorus and the Dardanelles uh, uh, Straits. So this is a very major uh, treaty uh, in the history of uh, not only Turkey, but all the Black Sea uh, Basin uh, countries. It's a very successful treaty. Uh, it is an insurance of the security of Turkey, uh, sovereignty of Turkey, as well as the peace in the Black Sea Basin. So they criticize that, you know, they say that, and as experts, they are experts of this very issue. Uh, many of them have been very instrumental in, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, making treaties and uh, um, establishing relationships, uh, diplomatic relationships, military relationships, uh, uh, keeping the peace in the uh, Black Sea. So they criticize uh, that uh, Montreux Treaty should not be discussed. It's a very issue. So Actionaire did not actually show uh, any support uh, for these criticisms uh, either. So I think in that sense, uh, she didn't uh, strike a successful uh, balance uh, between uh, distancing herself from the politics of the admirals uh, uh, and uh, supporting them as victims of authoritarianisms and as the legitimate critiques uh, of uh, major problems uh, in the military uh, as well as in the politics of the government. Mm -hmm. um, so, so she will need to correct that, yeah. I think. Um, so coming back to the, the content of the letter, you, you, you mentioned both the, uh, the picture of the admiral uh, as well as uh, the actual issue, which is uh, putting the Montreux Convention up for debate. So, um, I mean, Erdogan, you know, uh, has said that they will lay the groundwork uh, this summer for the Canal Istanbul project. Um, and then if, if that is actually case, if that is actually case, case, will the validity of the Montreux Conve Convention really be up for the debate? I mean, how is this advantageous for Erdogan in the international arena to, uh, to put this convention up for debate? How will it uh, serve him in terms of his uh, relationships uh, with, um, in the international arena? The short and most correct answer is we don't know. Uh, why? Because the motivation, reason, justification of this uh, mega project, Canal Istanbul, has never been clearly explained to the public by the government. Uh, it has been on the table uh, since uh, 2011. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it was the, the first time it was really mentioned by the government. It was 2011. Um, since then, there have been many legitimate uh, criticisms of this uh, project. Uh, environmentally, uh, diplomatically, uh, demographically, economically. Um, it's not clear who will finance this project. Um, it will be a disaster for the environment uh, in Istanbul. And given the economic crisis in Turkey and other prior health uh, crisis in Turkey and other uh, priorities, uh, it is really very unclear uh, why uh, the government is uh, uh, so much insisting uh, actually on this uh, project. It seems to be uh, very uh, central uh, to its uh, politics. Uh, therefore, we don't know exactly uh, what Erdogan, uh, what uh, benefits uh, Erdogan uh, expects from this project. And also uh, from, uh, in relation to this, from opening the Montreux Treaty uh, to some kind of a, a negotiation or discussion. So we don't know, but there seems to be some expectations. There may be some individual benefits, uh, there may be some um, benefits that the uh, AKP as a political party uh, may be getting, but it is very clear that uh, it is not in the interest of Turkey. 
Um, it is not in the interest of NATO uh, because it would weaken the very basis of Turkey's sovereignty uh, and uh, security, which would not be uh, good uh, for, uh, for NATO. It would not be uh, good uh, for uh, countries um, uh, uh, of the Black Sea Basin. Uh, because this is one of those rare international treaties uh, that have uh, been that has uh, been uh, in place, uh, accepted by all the parties uh, since uh, actually uh, uh, more than eighty years, uh, and it has actually maintained the peace in the in the Black Sea. Uh, it has uh, served the purpose. So. Um, I think it is uh, quite uh, mysterious, uh, but what we need to uh, uh, insist on uh, is uh, to ask the question uh, and to push the government to explain actually what exactly uh, the motivation is, um, but not nonsensical explanations, right? Uh, real explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the, how uh, is this project going to be financed? Uh, how is this going to be uh, to affect the environment uh, in Istanbul? How is it going to affect the uh, demography in Istanbul? And the Montreux Treaty, um, the, if the Montreux Treaty, I mean, uh, who is actually, um, who is uh, who's supporting uh, this? Uh, there have been accusations that the United States uh, is somehow supporting uh, a change in the Montreux Treaty. Is this true? Uh, we need to ask, the media has to ask, the Turkish public needs to ask. I don't think this is in the interest, of, in the long-term interest of the uh, United States. There have been some claims that uh, somehow China uh, or Russia uh, may be expecting some uh, benefits uh, from this. Is this true? We need to ask the Chinese embassy or, you know, Chinese government uh, and, you know, Russia. There needs to be a discussion about this. But what seems to be very clear to me is that uh, there is no uh, real benefit that can uh, result uh, from changing uh, the Montreux Treaty uh, for uh, Turkish people, uh, for uh, NATO, uh, and uh, for the Black Sea Basin countries. Mm -hmm. Professor Murat Sonar, thank you so much for your assessment and for having joined us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Former People's Democratic Party MP Omar Farouk Gargarlooğlu was detained at his home on April 2nd. In the hours following his forceful detention, Gargarlooğlu was hospitalized and put in intensive care. On April 3rd, he was arrested while in the hospital and taken to the Sinjan prison in the capital, Ankara. In a Twitter post, Gergerlioğlu's son Salih Gergerlioğlu said, they came to arrest my father. Gergerlioğlu shared footage of the moment of his father's detention, which showed police officers not allowing the politician to put on his shoes and preventing him from speaking. Following his detention, Gergerlioğlu was taken to the Ankara City Hospital and put in intensive care after undergoing angiography. HDP members and Gergerlioğlu's son were not allowed to visit him the next morning when they went to the hospital. According to HDP deputy Mahmut Torul, Gergerlioğlu was taken out of the intensive care unit and taken to the prison without anyone being informed, as if he was abducted. We were not allowed to meet with the doctors and hospital officers on the pretext of weekend. We couldn't get beyond security officers despite all our efforts, he said. While we were waiting in front of the hospital, soldiers were waiting at the door. But then the teams suddenly left there. While we were waiting, he was secretly taken out. Gergerlioğlu is currently imprisoned in Ankara's Sinjan prison. Ömer Faruk Gergerlioğlu was sentenced to two years and six months in prison on the charge of propagandizing for a terrorist organization on February 21, 2018, because of a social media post from 2016. The conviction was upheld by the 16th Penal Chamber of the Court of Cassation on February 19. On March 17, he was stripped off his MP duty. Gergerlioğlu refused to leave parliament premises after he was stripped off his status and started his resistance in the HDP's room. Early on March 21, police officers entered the parliament and detained Gergerlioğlu, who was in his pajamas and preparing for the morning prayers. Thousands of members of the HDP, Turkey's third largest party, have been tried as part of a years-long crackdown on the party over alleged links to the PKK. Last month, a top prosecutor moved to shut down the party, but the indictment was sent back to the prosecutor on procedural grounds. 
the European Union's top two officials, European Council President Charles Michel and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, were in the Turkish capital Ankara on April 6 to pay a rare visit to President Erdogan. While human rights violations have taken on a troubling turn over the past few months, the European leaders proposed a positive agenda with Erdogan, improving customs relations, facilitating visa grants to Turkish citizens, and above all, extending the agreement regarding refugees. The visit by the officials follows an EU summit last month at which the bloc said work could begin on deeper trade ties and on providing more money for refugees in Turkey. Following the meeting with Erdogan, Michel and von der Leyen were asked about the Turkey's failure to implement ECHR decisions for the release of businessperson and rights defender Osman Kavala and People's Democratic Party former co-chair Selahattin Demirtas. Von der Leyen said human rights were not a negotiable issue. Michel, on his end, stated that the rule of law and respect for fundamental rights are essential values of the EU. But asserting these values in front of the cameras did not save executives from criticism. Turkey rapporteur Nacho Amor Sanchez tweeted ahead of the visit. Tomorrow's visit from von der Leyen and EU CEO president is of the highest standard. EU must send a political message to Turkey. If human rights doesn't get the place it deserves in this, in the toughest crackdown in years, this will be the worst message we can send. Do values matter? The meeting itself quickly descended into what media outlets have dubbed Sofagate. A video of the leaders showed Erdogan and Michel settling themselves into gilded chairs while von der Leyen appeared unsure of where she was expected to sit. Von der Leyen stood staring at them and said, Ahem. Von der Leyen was ultimately offered a couch opposite to Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu. According to a statement made by Çavuşoğlu, protocol officers from Ankara and Brussels had discussed arrangements before a visit by the top officials of the European Union to Turkey, and the protocol order was arranged in line with the suggestions of the EU. EU Commission spokesperson Eric Maymer told the media on April 7 that von der Leyen was surprised by the incident but she chose to prioritize substance over questions of form or protocol. Michel on his end noted the regrettable character of the situation, but that he and von der Leyen had chosen not to aggravate it with a public incident and to prioritize the substance of their discussion. Good Party Chair Meral Akshenash and Ankara Mayor Mansur Yavash marked the 31st anniversary of an uprising by Uyghurs against the Chinese government, prompting the Chinese embassy in Ankara to condemn the politicians. Akshenar and Yavash's post on Twitter made reference to the killing of Uyghurs by Chinese forces during an uprising in Baran district in April 1990, describing the events as a massacre. We will not remain silent about their persecution and martyrdom. Akshenar said on Twitter. Yavash said, we still feel the pain of the massacre in 1990. The Chinese embassy, in turn, tagged Akshenar and Yavash in two Twitter posts, defending the country's policies and stating that the Chinese side reserves its rights to a rightful response. The Chinese side determinedly opposes any person of power that in any way challenges China's sovereignty and territorial integrity and strongly condemns this, the embassy said. In turn, Ambassador Liu Xiaobin was summoned to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but no further details were provided. China has come under scrutiny over its treatment of its Uyghur minority, a mostly Muslim people who speak a Turkic language. Several NGOs and countries have accused China of persecuting Uyghurs, subjecting them to various abuses in camps. Beijing rejects these accusations and maintains the camps are professional training centers against extremism. Turkey's opposition has long criticized the ruling AKP for remaining silent on China's oppression of the Uyghurs. Many of the 40,000 Uyghurs in Turkey have also been critical of the Turkish government's approach to Beijing after China approved an extradition treaty in December which they fear may lead to them being sent back to China to face vague charges which they deny. However, the Turkish parliament has yet to ratify the agreement. As part of the ongoing protests at Boğaziçi University, nearly 5,000 signatures have been collected from the university's alumni for a joint statement inviting the appointed rector Melih Buluk to resign. 
The joint statement and signatures were placed in front of the rector's office with a statement read by the representatives of the alumni. The statement read, we request that Melik Bulu resign from office as soon as possible so that the high benefit of the public can be ensured, the institution of the university can fulfill its function in the best way possible, and a way can be paved for a participatory and democratic election. That's all from this week in Turkey. See you next Friday at 9 p.m. Good night.